So that I have one foot sort of deeply entrenched in the administrative aspect of medicine. Um, and I have oversight as uh, Director of Medical Affairs for University Hospital, which includes the critical care arenas as well as the respiratory care. Uh, we have a very integrated system in critical care that's a multidisciplinary trauma and life support center that has mixed med surge, trauma transplant, general surgery, medical. We have intensivists from medicine, surgery, and anesthesia. We rotate house officers from medicine, surgery, and anesthesia. It would not be unusual to have a anesthesia staff with a senior surgical chief along with an orthopedic intern admit a DKA patient. It would not be unusual to have a medical patient, medical staff from pulmonary critical care follow the surgical patients in the ICU. So it's a very integrative multidisciplinary unit. And University of Wisconsin is a major transplant center and transplant is a major part of the process. It's a major product line and it's a major part of what we actually do. And that extends as well into the organ donor management component. So what I was going to do today was show you sort of an overview, a compilation really, of what normally would be four to six hours of presentations. We do these for the departments of neurology, neurosurgery, anesthesia, medicine, and surgery. This forms the basis of the rotating grand rounds. <clears throat> it similarly forms the basis of the core curriculum for the house staff, both internally as well as these presentations are given externally throughout our region from an OPO perspective and from an organ donor management standpoint. Um, we've done reasonably well with this. Our consent rates historically have been over 90 percent, conversion rates approaching 90 percent. So it's an integral part of the process of how critical care curriculums are configured at University Hospital. The program as it's set forth is usually divided into the end of life components. I think as you recognize that as we unfold into these quality metrics evidenced by the C. Um, CMS's announcement yesterday that they're not going to pay for complications related to how we track information and data. I think we'll similarly see end of life quality indicators unfold along with core regulatory um, indicators. And I think the reality as time unfolds, we'll see a migration into tracking end of life. So we have one hour dedicated to end of life care, particularly focusing on communication that would exist between patients and the actual attending staff physician in the uh, trauma life support center. And I think as that unfolds, as we look at quality indicators, particularly patient satisfaction indicators, that that creates an intensive care environment that's very facilitative towards the consent process. We've done that informally. We're now formalizing that. And I think that's part of the reason why our consent rates have historically been so high. Uh, this is the university system, and I sort of embed it down here in the trauma life support center, which is our multidisciplinary mixed med surge ICU. Uh, this now is the pediatric hospital. This is the interdisciplinary research center that's been built. This is the uh, new medical school and pharmacy school. So as you can tell, that's obliterated all of our parking. Um, but because the lake's frozen six months a year, it's not a big problem because we can just park right out on the frozen lake. So now the VA hospital, as you can count, is almost 10 stories. And it has an average census today of about 80. So each patient has almost half a wing to themselves. <laughs> So what I was going to talk to you a bit, and again, I keep this as an open forum. Feel free to interject and ask questions or sort of solicit input, uh, only because I can tell you what I, would, what I would convey is really anecdotal empiricism and heuristics. There are no evidence-based trials. There is very little information, if any. So what I can do is share with you the 15 to 16 years I've had of specifically managing organ donors at University Hospital and at least try and convey the sense that we have and the standardized approach that we've undertaken towards that process. So I'd leave it as an open forum. If there are questions, I have no set agenda. I'll walk through as much of this as I can looking at the process. Unfortunately, there is not much organ donor management embedded in any med school curriculum in our own school included, nursing school curriculum. I directed the Pulmonary Critical Care Fellowship for almost 13 years, and those of you who have been through ACGME interrogations, of which I went through four or five, there's not even a blip on the ACGME radar related to organ donor management. There are virtually no CMEs directed toward this, and there are fundamentally no randomized controlled trials. There's virtually no evidence that's real strong level one type evidence to then define a management strategy. And all that is, I think, exceedingly unfortunate because with the escalating demand for organs and our almost virtual static supply, the maximal utilization and the optimal management of the existing donor pool is the most immediate and practical solution to the organ donor crisis.
And I say that again parenthetically because I think that's the most important part of any take home message that I could give to you is that the immediate and practical solution really is the maximal utilization and the optimal management of the existing donor pool that's in your ICU, that's in our ICU. It really is one unique opportunity that we have to simultaneously medically manage six to eight other lives at once. And that's really the conceptual framework of operationalizing donor care management is to conceptualize to the caregivers, whether they're traumatologists, medical intensivists, neurointensivists, is that this is a unique opportunity, realizing that the donor is dead, to have some good come from the tragedy, that this is really the fundamental medical management of six to eight other lives at once. And with the increasing recognition of an immunologic continuum between the donors and the recipients, the intensity of the inflammatory response in the donor probably dwarfs what we see in sepsis. This creates the framework of inflammation that's thought to lead to the immunogenicity that's prevalent in the delayed graft function and the longitudinal <laughs> abnormalities in transplant grafts. The consequence of which is that the goal in management is to mitigate again ongoing ischemia reperfusion injury. And that's really thought to be the bigger culprit that jeopardizes organ function. That really is predicated upon solid intensive care management that's indistinguishable from the management that you would have for any other patient in intensive care. And it is the simultaneous medical management of six to eight other lives. And all these look like little stick figures that have a great deal of anonymity. There really is no anonymity here. These are real people. These are real people waiting time on the transplant list. And I think any of you who've taken care of kidney patients who are in renal failure, maintained on dialysis, the change in their lifestyle, the quality of their life, the incremental amount of things they can do when they get deburdened from dialysis with a kidney transplant is enormous. From a societal perspective, it's unambiguously clearly more cost effective to have a patient transplant it than it would be to have ongoing dialysis. 10 to 15 percent of the patients who are on the heart-lung list will actually die on the heart-lung list. There is enormous opportunity in the critical care arena to then establish more functionality in the organs and then stabilize the donor so those organs can actually be procured. I frame the discussion around the background of the supply-to-band relationship highlighting lung donors. And the actual supply has by and large remained virtually static. One might argue that the collaborative and HRSA have increased this to a degree, but the supply is virtually static. The demand continues to accelerate. There are currently over 100,000 patients on the transplant waiting list today. And I'd highlight lungs because from a societal perspective, we have probably the most egregious job in turn, have done the most egregious job in procuring lungs. 15 to 17 percent of actual donors have lungs procured, recognizing that the conversion rate, which is the number of potentials converted to actuals, is only about 50% or so. That means that only 8% of potential organ donors have lungs procured. So from a lung perspective, there's enormous opportunity to really enhance the management skills of the intensive care environment to work with the OPO to facilitate greater procurement in that arena. If one were to look at the largest 300 hospitals in the country, there's enormous variability between some hospitals that convert 20 to 30 percent of their potential donors to actual donors, others convert 80 to 90 percent of potential organ donors. Enormous variability amongst the largest hospitals in the country. I guess as a PG-26, as of July, I'm old enough to remember Standard Oil, any other PG-6 type, 20, PG-26 type people over 50, remember that? Well, Standard became ESSO, which became Exxon. And it actually originated, why they called it Standard Oil had to do with the fact oil was discovered in western Pennsylvania in the late 1860s, 70s. Cleveland was the oil capital of the country at that point in time. And J.D. Rockefeller produced a horrible product. It was not consistent. The kerosene distillation process was colossally ineffective, inefficient. It didn't sell. So he brought over a fellow, an Englishman, who was a chemist named Andrews. And Andrews later became a managing partner in the, the entire conglomerate and operation. But he was a chemist who really standardized the distillation process. And it worked. And it sold. And they were so enamored with the process of standardization that they named the oil company Standard Oil. So whether it's the GE Six Sigma, the Toyota product line, or what we're being hoist upon by IHI, 
it's standardization. It's mitigating the variability, consistently doing the right thing, standardizing process that ultimately facilitates outcome, whether it's distilling oil or taking care of patients. Granted, there is variability embedded within patients, and that goes without saying, but it's consistency of process and migrating through a standardized process, really, that facilitates better outcomes. The key things embedded in organ donor management that are standard, both from an experiential model as well as from a literature model, would be surveillance to define those patients who are highly likely to proceed to brain death, an unambiguous, unequivocal understanding of the physiology of brain death and a standardized methodology for its declaration, an unequivocal request for consent at every instance, and the optimal medical management of the donor. The optimal medical management of the donor is actually of pivotal importance because one, the donor has to survive somatically so procurement can be undertaken. It really requires a focus shift away from cerebral protective strategies to optimizing end organ function in those patients who would be the recipient. With the increasingly recognized immunologic continuum between the donor and the recipient, how we manage the donor in the intensive care unit, again, not only impacts upon the procurement, but it similarly impacts upon the quality of the organ and the quality of life of the recipient. So there is an enormous emphasis in our ICU with the donor management team to really assume the management of this population and to treat this population as an indistinguishable patient from any other patient in the ICU. We'll skip surveillance other than to say uh, there's a lot of literature on how you survey these patients. The reality is in most large ICUs, roughly 6% of all deaths are brain death. So we will admit 25, 2,600 patients per year into our ICU. We have an SMR of about 0.68 with an absolute mortality, probably is somewhere around 220, 230 patients a year. If you multiply the numbers out, we'll have about 22 to 24 deaths per year from brain death in our intensive care unit. I'm sure it's not a whole lot different. Other ICUs that have different orientations, maybe a little more, a little less, but roughly 6% of an admitted population who dies will die of brain death. That's not to count for the 95 plus percent of patients who die with care being withdrawn or withheld in critical care today. The idea of somebody dying with their foot on the gas going 100 miles an hour with a full resuscitation almost doesn't happen. Many times with ECMO and things like that, sometimes it's hard to figure out who's alive and who's not alive. But the reality is the withdrawal of life support dominates the end of life for many patients in ICU, but about 6% actually have physiologic brain death. And the original description of brain death was by Harvey Cushing in 1901. This is his original manuscript. And this is the lab animal that Harvey Cushing used. So the bonus question is, what animal did Harvey Cushing use in his lab research? I don't know. There's room to be a neurosurgeon who would, neurosurgical resin who was only working 140 hours a week and he got sent to the lab for a year and was never seen again. So but it was actually baboons. What Cushing described was Cushing's response, which is a compensatory increase in catecholamines to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure gradients. After the initial activation of the vagus nerve, precipitating bradycardia, what he described was ischemia at the own virtual medullary level that generates this intense catecholamine surge to maintain the gradient. So with Poisson's law being applied with incremental pressure at the downstream, you have to have a higher perfusion pressure gradient to maintain flow. And this is a compensatory response. What he did actually miss initially was the vagal activation. So the first sign of increased intracranial pressure with incipient herniation really is bradycardia, hypotension, and low flow. With ischemia at the pons level, consequent to this rostral caudal progression of ischemia, this is what Cushing actually described. With ischemia at the medullary junction, this is really sympathetic surges, catecholamine levels two to 3,000 fold normal to maintain perfusion pressure gradients. This is an enormous stress to the myocardium, jeopardizes left ventricular function significantly, but in animal models probably shown to jeopardize right ventricular function even more than left ventricular function. Coincident with this catecholamine surge and the ischemia at this area is hypothalamic pituitary destruction, thought to relate to the ischemic events and pituitary destruction that is thought to be the provocation for the endocrinopathy of brain death. Very speculative, very uncertain. You could cut my head off today and my thyroid binding at the periphery would probably be the same for a week. 
many patients who take thyroid don't take it for a week and there's no, no major losses there. So it's a very speculative phenomenon, probably more related to the intensity of the inflammatory response and a almost virtual euthyroid sick or the relative adrenal process that's thought to occur consequent to inflammation. But for whatever reason, this has now become embedded in the culture of organ donor management. And there is a fair amount of animal data, some human retrospective data that suggests using hormonal cocktails actually facilitates recrudescence of organ function. Hypothalamic destruction leaves a poikothermic patient who has thermoregulatory impairment, and when the ischemia reaches the spinal cord, there's sympathetic deactivation and a de-innervated patient. So oftentimes it's the triple whammy of hemodynamic instability. It's intravascular volume depletion in an attempt to then mitigate against cranial pressure and swelling, profound cardiac abnormalities consequent to the catecholamine surge and the antecedent pre-neurocardiac axis damage that occurs with severe brain injury and vasodilatation. So it's a very complex population to manage and to manage well. This is a serendipitously gotten MRI of a fellow who herniated in the midst of his MRI. Presented with nausea, vomiting, seen on neurology service, CT was normal, sent over to MRI. He herniated and died in the MRI scan or brain death. So you can see the comparative um, MRI images of the magnitude of the compression at the brain stem level. So this is brain death in evolution. The pathophysiology of the graft is really thought to be related to ischemia reperfusion injury. And this occurs at multiple junctures related to the in initial resuscitation, the catecholamine brain death storm, which has such an intense level of vasoconstriction that it jeopardizes organ flow to maintain flow to the brain, followed by vasodilatation, reperfusion, and then multiple instances of storage and retransplantation. I think all of you know these are the sequelae, the physiologic phenomena related to ischemia reperfusion. This is thought to occur possibly against the background of an endocrinopathy, dominated really by thyroid and cortisol abnormalities. Thyroid has dominated that literature, and it, it's very, very, very convincing in animal models, particularly if thyroid hormone is thought to maintain the mitochondria, which then allows for energy uptake, ATP production. Loss of thyroid hormone jeopardizes that ability, and then it's a transition from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. Multiple animal studies have shown giving whopping doses of thyroid hormone almost recrudesce the hormonal milieu and actually re re um, revamp metabolism from a anaerobic metabolism into aerobic. Yet there are multiple studies that can't even define the presence or absence of an endocrinopathy. There are multiple studies that show no correlation between lactate levels, organ dysfunction, and the level of the hormonal concoctions or the hormonal levels. So it is a very speculative thing, but it's now become entrenched in a lot of the management protocols simply based on the very appealing notion that if you've lost your hypothalamic and pituitary axis, you must be relatively hypothyroid. The ischemia reperfusion injury is thought to activate donor cells. The intensity of the inflammatory response is significant. This produces a local inflammatory response, which is thought to then engender graft immunogenicity, which is amplified by reperfusion and is thought to form some bases, not all, but some part of acute and delayed graft dysfunction, as well as longitudinal elements of dysfunction. Again, grafts that don't do well initially tend not to do well longitudinally. This is probably, I think, best exemplified in the renal transplant literature where non-HLA matched living donors, non-HLA matched living donors almost uniformly do worse than HLA matched cadaveric donors, almost uniformly do worse. And it suggests that brain death is not really static and the graft's not biologically inert but this intense inflammatory response in the donor engenders an immunogenicity in the recipient, in that organ when it's transplanted. And the graft is actually inflamed and primed to be activated and, and participate in this host allo responsiveness that would be delayed graft function. So the idea is to mitigate against the inflammatory response on an ongoing basis in the donor. In the future, the strategies won't be necessarily targeted at using the UW solution to then preserve what's already damaged. We'll move more and more into attenuation strategies, which is what our labs are looking at now in terms of IL-1 blockers and other things, much like septus, things like activated protein C, other things that blunt the inflammatory response and precipitate and rather and um, 
mitigate against the inflammation in the donor rather than storing an organ that's already damaged. The intersection of transplantation and brain death really occurred in 1967. This is the cover of Newsweek when Christian Barnard transplanted the heart of brain dead 19 year old actually, I thought she was 19 year old um, Anne Duveral into a 56 year old cardiomyopathy patient. Probably the second time that had ever been done. One case in Belgium probably before this, but this was the case that really achieved the notoriety that really jets in the discussion of what constituted brain death. Remember, Mullerett published his landmark paper in 1959. Heretofore, brain death had never actually really been described. 1967, this was an exceedingly controversial process, exceedingly controversial. And I read to you the accompanying editorial that says, when in fact is a person dead enough to be deprived of vital organs needed to maintain the life of another human being? So this is not ancient history. This is actually relatively new. This is, this is 1967. Consequence of this, well actually the, the lead we got from this was from our colleagues in the American Legal College who said you're dead when your doctor says you are. And death comes when a physician has done everything to save the patient's life and comes to a point where he feels the patient can't live. Well, that sort of rather patronizing view of defining life and death for patients probably wasn't applicable then and certainly wouldn't be applicable today. Consequent to this, Beecher convened a group at Harvard, the Ad Hoc Committee to Define Brain Death, that was done in 1968. It wasn't until 1983 that the President's Commission actually equated cardiac and brain death. So. This is just after I graduated from medical school. So I was a medical student. The idea of brain death was a very uncertain process. It was only in 83 that it actually became codified and equated to cardiac death. The committee was made up of members from the School of Law, Medicine, Divinity, Public Health, and they put together the criteria that eventually were used, embellished a bit, and constituted what the President's Commission suggested. So we're, we're fairly simple in the Midwest. Uh, we watch a lot of TV, uh, don't get out much, winters are cold, and we depend upon the West Coast to kind of guide us. And probably one of the best delineations of certifying brain death comes from the Wizard of Oz. And it's got to be morally, ethically, spiritually, physically, positively, absolutely, undeniably, reliably dead. Not merely dead, but seriously dead. And I say this not to be flippant, I say this not to be facetious, because there's nothing in medicine that anybody should be more sure of than declaring somebody dead. There's actually nothing that dissuades the family's confidence, that dismays the family as having a patient being pronounced dead, then being pronounced undead, and then being pronounced dead again. It is the absolute prerequisite for organ donation to proceed. It is the absolute prerequisite, really, for the discussions to occur with families. And it's an absolute critical part of intensive care. Probably 85 to 90 percent of our deaths are done on physical exam. We use widget position paper. We march through the exclusions, preconditions, look for the reason for death, and it's almost always self-evident. March through the cranial nerves, do apnea tests, and the vast overwhelming majority of deaths in our unit are done via physical exam, and that's how we do it. And it's done by the intensive care service, by the neurology, or more likely neurosurgical service who does this. So it's an integral part of the process of training. In the core curriculum that we have, we have an hour of end of life. We have one separate hour that I teach to neurosurgery, neurology, anesthesia, medicine, surgery on the diagnosis of brain death. Then we have cardiac and pulmonary management. So this is a one hour lecture specifically on the history, the physiology, and actual declaration process for brain death. There's extraordinary variability in the country in how this is done, what the requirements are. In reality, it's a very simplistic, straightforward process that requires exclusions be taken out of the picture, preconditions be satisfied, a reason for the coma, cranial nerve dysfunction, apnea tests. If any of the physical exam findings cannot be undertaken, it warrants a complementary test or a confirmatory test. And that's the model that we've used, and the vast majority are done via physical exam. Talking very briefly about consent, I, I think one might argue that the capacity to facilitate optimal consent is really predicated upon the stature and the processes involved in end-of-life in care in that ICU. Uh, 
recognizing clearly that there are basic sociodemographic characteristics for patient substrate, i.e. there's multiple data points that suggest certain ethnic groups, um, certain circumstances, donor cards facilitate that. But the reality is part of the capacity to ensure that there's a quality care in the ICU, and particularly a quality end of life care and patient family satisfaction facilitates the actual transition in care. In our system, we do separate these, the diagnosis of brain death and the request for consent unless asked by the family, but we spend an enormous amount of time on quality metrics, quality items for end of care and end of life. And if one looks at the Robert Wood Johnson and multiple position papers and particularly the evolution of quality indicators, I don't think there's any question that these will be embedded in reporting structures in the very near future related to intensive care. So there are about 18 quality metrics now that can be looked at. And as one proceeds with quality of end-of-life care, and again, recognizing that probably 95% of the patients who die in the ICU have care withdrawn, and one in five Americans will die in an ICU. This really is an integral part of intensive care medicine. We formed a working group of about 20 people, broad representation from medicine, surgery, nursing, department um, directors and family services, bereavement, palliative care, and put together our own sort of end of life process that focuses upon care of the patient, family, ensuring donation is built into end of life as is autopsy. My own personal autopsy consent rate's about 85% because every single case has a request for autopsy made. The autopsy is done by the team that took care of the patient with me, reported to the family that day. Call goes out to the family, letter in two days, formal letter with neuropath in six weeks. About 15 to 20 percent of the families actually come back and review the autopsy item by item. So again, it underscores that having a consistent, integrated, process for end of life is actually imperative to ensure donation is built into the process. Equally as important, I think, to admitting patients is how we discharge them. Well, all the criteria that we're up against now in terms of mandated reporting for handoffs, handing somebody off terminally is equally as important. So we dedicate a substantial amount of time and effort. It's faculty driven at the bedside. The critical care service actually handles all the DCD cases. And when lethality has been defined or futility has been defined or brain death, those cases are actually transferred to the critical care service. Medical management is the last step, and I, I'd underscore that this really is a collaborative, multidisciplinary effort. I think it's inherently no different than any other patient. It's the medical management of six to eight other lives at once, simultaneously. And in reality, if we had a 21-year-old college student that came in with meningococcal meningitis, who had DIC, cardiac dysfunction, needed dialysis, the rapidity with which we would move in securing access for dialysis, getting a cardiac echo, transfusing appropriate products would be staggering. In reality, with a donor, we're managing six to eight other lives at once. So it's the same level of focus, the same level of intensity, the same collaborative relationships that should exist in multidisciplinary critical care units. This is the paradigm that we use for DCD when the primary service, whether it be trauma, neurosurge, or neurology, has actually discussed the case, and again, this comes after the delineation of futility. This is the non-brain dead population. That discussion occurs staff to staff. The critical care service then assumes management and the palliative care aspects of that and undertakes a withdrawal of care. Again, this is a separated discussion. There is an initial delineation of futility that the family is unambiguously on board, that they've all reached a unanimity and consensus that this would not be anything that the patient would want. Care is to be withdrawn. The OPO meets with the family. If there's consent for donation, then the critical care service assumes management. In other instances where lethality, the gunshot wound to the head, or if a patient has been declared brain dead, the donor management team is actified, activated rather, uh, as a PG-26 uh, now, I, I guess I've been able to delegate some of this, so we have the critical care service triage attending, although I'm always the backup for that, and these patients are managed in conjunction with the OPO. The focus oftentimes, as it should be, is on cardiopulmonary management, because one, the donor has to survive an optimizing organ function for the other kidney, liver, pancreas, really is predicated upon solid hemodynamic management. And I think what I'd underscore is that we oftentimes inherit a patient who already has significant neurocardiac axis abnormalities.
clear data from subarachnoid hemorrhage in patients who survived show significant cardiac impairment. So obviously the tier of patients who've succumbed to their illness are probably at a much higher level of neurocardiac injury. Against that background, prior to brain death, there's the brain death event itself, which is an enormous automatic surge, creating profound levels of balance between myocardial oxygen demand and supply, and release of the catecholamines at the neuroadrenergic terminals jeopardizes myocardial contractility. After the brain death process, there's a school of thought in Europe that suggests that the heart's actually normal but there's loss of the coronary perfusion pressure gradient that jeopardizes cardiac function. That being said, against the background of the endocrinopathy, really leads to a series of things that conspire to jeopardize left ventricular function. This is the reality of the patient that we're left to care for. Recent data from the West Coast looking specifically at subarachnoid hemorrhage and high-grade Hunt-Hess uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage injuries suggests that, surprisingly, somewhere around 10 to 30 percent will have systolic impairment, diastolic impairment in about three quarters. And again, these are in survivors of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So these are patients who, when you do the first echo after brain death, these are survivors. And you can only extrapolate to suggest that the actual patients who died probably had much greater degree of neurocardiac axis abnormalities. But it would not be at all surprising to see an abnormal cardiac echo. Would there be any suspicion in the 21-year-old who was playing basketball the day before, who got shot in the head, who had an ejection fraction of 20% the day before? Highly unlikely. So the neurocardiac axis has an enormous contribution that's very unrecognized. And in the survivors, a lot of this is a reversible process. A lot of the cardiac abnormalities seen with neurologic injury are reversible. In looking at Estimates of blood flow with Sestamibi scans or assessments of neuroadrenergic catecholamines with MIBIG scanning. If one has normal flow but a global defect on, the, again, this is analogous to a pheochromocytoma scanning process looking at catecholamine uptake, with a global defect that occurs with subarachnoid hemorrhage, ejection fraction mean of about 43%. Hunt has grade 5, 80% will have troponin release most early on. So it's, it's critical to remember that many of these patients with cardiac dysfunction have antecedent damage before the brain death event. And the brain death event is an enormous catecholamine surge that profoundly jeopardizes myocardial function. So these things all conspire together to jeopardize heart function. The sympathetic surge, the antecedent injury, the speculative component of hormonal depletion, and a loss of coronary perfusion pressure gradients. This is somewhat of an ethically challenged study from France. And I think as many of you see, probably around two thirds of the patients have the autonomic surge that occurs. The response to increased intracranial pressure, maintaining perfusion pressure gradients, blood pressures of 260 over 140, heart rate of 130, lasts about an hour, hour and a half. This is incipient herniation. This is again, as the downstream pressure goes up, you have to maintain a perfusion pressure gradient for flow. Well, this study in France actually treated that. They treated the compensatory response dominantly with esmolol. And I present this again not to underscore that this, in my view, would be a treatment option, but simply to underscore the magnitude of the cardiac dysfunction that's seen purely related to the catecholamine surge with brain death. If one looks at those patients that had no autonomic surge, compared to those who had an autonomic surge that was not treated, compared to those who had the autonomic surge that was treated, dramatic improvement in cardiac function after brain death and suitability for transplantation. So again, I'd underscore that I, I by no means would advocate doing this. I think this is incredibly ethically challenged in the context that we're aborting the compensatory mechanism to maintain cerebral blood flow. I think all of us have taken care of people who are on the cusp of herniation who had the catecholamine surge and able to either decrease the ICP or augment the mean arterial pressure to maintain flow, and these patients have survived. So doing this, in my mind, would be predicated upon some clairvoyance that we know who's going to survive and who's not going to survive. So I'd underscore that this really is more related to understanding the physiology and the implications that it has on the cardiac system. Similarly, as one looks at cardiac allograft vasculopathy, and these are the manifestations, very common when the explosive mode of brain death occurs, 
increase, increase, uh, increase incidence of intermyel, myo, myo proliferation, inter, inter, myo intimal proliferation, coronary arteries, sudden death, need for revascularization. All these things are much more common. In a domino transplant where the heart's procured and there is no brain death, the reality is it's not seen very much at all. So again, you can't underestimate the magnitude of the contribution that brain death makes to cardiac function and the hemodynamic instability that ensues thereafter. So this is a very simple algorithm, nothing rocket science, incredibly straightforward, just core tenants, no significant medical management, simply standardizing process generated increased organ recovery and organs transplanted. USC, which has pioneered a lot of the donor management work, hypothesized that brain death complications would have no effect on the number of organs donated if these patients were aggressively managed. And again, this is as sick a cohort as any organ donor population that you or I would ever see. What they're able to show was that if one aggressively managed these patients, there was no significant effect of the complications or the number of organs procured. So it underscores that aggressive management, and again, ensuring that there's a continuum of management. Simply because the patient's brain dead, there ought not be an enormous hiatus away from any management until the care process may be terminated or stopped. It's aggressive management while the family has the opportunity to then define the donor opportunity. In this particular study, there were many, many side-off, spin-off effects, but the greatest, greatest benefit appeared to be abolition of the loss from cardiovascular collapse. They almost aborted the cardiovascular collapse, almost completely aborted it. If you look at the number of donors, they aggressively manage these patients. Historically, 25% of organ donors are lost during maintenance. With aggressive management, these patients can be maintained. Simply looking at the woman who was at the NIH with the brain tumor that was pregnant, was kept alive for how long? You can do it up to six weeks. The average time to death in the Japanese series where brain death was not accepted until 2002, the time from brain death to somatic death, an average of 23 days. So with good support, these people can be maintained. And I'm not arguing that we ought to keep them supported for 23 days, but there is an intense period during that window where they can be supported to mitigate ischemia reperfusion injury. This is the algorithm that we have that's predicated on stability assessments, and that requires echocardiograms, mean arterial pressure above 60, vasoactive requirement in any combination less than 10, and a urine output more than a C per hour per kilogram. If these thresholds are achieved with an EF that's reasonable over 45%, that would be construed to be a stable donor, and then age would dictate the necessity of cardiac catheterization. As one sort of blows this component up and takes a little bit more look at it, if those stability thresholds are not achieved, I think the limited literature that exists might argue that a some metric of volume pump function and impedance ought to be incorporated. Now, there is data in the donor literature to suggest pulmonary artery catheters, which has been unusual because there is no support in any other aspect of medicine that I'm aware of that delineates the use of PA catheters preferentially over anything else. And I think that the rationale for this comes from the comparative series that have looked at management. And if you have the Papworth England group who aggressively manages donors, has an anesthesia intensivist at the bedside, and goes through a two-hour intense block of management, and compare that to a poor organ donor coordinator who's not a physician, who's managing a patient 100 miles away with a 16-gauge IV over the phone, my guess is you're going to see enormous differences. So whether it's a PA cath, a Lidco cardiac output, continuous stoximetry, CVPs, continuous echo Doppler, something to assess volume in the reservoir, hydraulic pump function, and the level of vascular impedance. This is the model that we torture our house staff with. It looks like an arcane engineering model, the circulation, but in reality it's an infinitely more simplistic way to look at circulatory mechanics rather than the traditional etiologic approach of this is cardiac, this is neuro, this must be sepsis, because nothing usually behaves itself consistently within all three domains of the hydraulic model. And this really exploits Guyton's original work in the 1950s, looking at volume in a venous capacitance reservoir that generates venous return to two hydraulic pumps linked in series. Because they're both in series, they can be conceptualized as a singular 
hydraulic pump, which then empties into an arterial impedance system. So any hemodynamic abnormality, whether it's sepsis, PE, hypovolemia, can be characterized and defined by the abnormalities in the hydraulic model. The organ donor tends to be intravascularly depleted, at least initially, in a low flow state, secondary to cardiac abnormalities, and usually vasodilated, almost uniformly vasodilated. So hypovolemia, cardiac dysfunction, with some variability, but almost uniform vasodilatation. This is a complex and busy slide because taking care of donors is a complex and busy process. The reality is it's very controversial because there are no randomized controlled trials, absolutely none. So what I tell you is heuristics, it's anecdotal empiricism, it's 15, 16 years of taking care of dead people and reading dead people physiology and sort of at the bedside trying to define how best things respond. It's very compromised as well because the data on catecholamines are often derived from antecedent literature that uniformly and blanketly um, took on the vasopressors as sort of evil mongers of cardiac dysfunction. In reality, there's probably conventional doses of dopamine have immunomodulatory effects. So there's probably a lot of lack of attention early on paid to the underlying state of volume repletion in these patients, which has really handicapped this literature in terms of giving you absolute recommendations. The hypovolemia is usually manifest consequent to ICP treatment, whether it's fluid restriction, diuretics, or mannitol. Hyperglycemia and osmotic diuresis are common. DI is almost uniform. The poikothermic patient can't really conserve fluid. So all these things together conspire, particularly related to the ICP treatment, to present with an initially volume depleted patient. Judicious fluid resuscitation is absolutely pivotal, and I say judicious because the single largest loss of lungs probably has to do with the fact that you've got distortion in the pressure volume relationship in the left ventricle consequent to brain death. Small amount of volume generates a higher pressure against the background of an intense inflammatory response in the lungs in a process almost indistinguishable from ARDS, precipitating extravascular lung water, fluid accumulation, cosmetically appearing the chest x-ray and jeopardizing the PaO2. So all those things together really conspire to lose lungs and it's judicious volume resuscitation and managing these patients, I think, really requires the ability to adjudicate competing interests. The above the diaphragm transplanters would rather have the lungs exceedingly dry. The below the diaphragm transplanters would rather have the lungs, rather have the kidneys just gushy, moist, and augmenting flow. Keep in mind that two predictive indicators for improved kidney function that can be done in the ICU are a urine output more than 100 cc's per hour and a decay in the creatinine in the six hour window before procurement. That really requires volume. That's the antithesis of what the lung transplant program wants. They want it dry. The blacker the lung looks, the better it looks aerated. You can cosmetically fix that by drying somebody out. You can bump their tidal volume up to 15 cc's per kilogram, increase their mean airway pressure, and make it look really black. Doesn't necessarily help the lung, but it cosmetically improves it to the point where those lungs can be procured. So one strategy for this would be look at suitability of the lungs. If the lungs clearly are not suitable, if you can't use them, you've got a big gunshot to the chest, you've got massive aspiration, it's clear nobody's going to use those lungs. Well, then an overall strategy of a little bit more liberal fluid use, as long as one can maintain oxygen transport indices to the periphery is probably appropriate. On the other hand, if you've got marginal lungs, and marginality in the lungs is two types. One is the antecedent marginality, which is the smokers where we breach the 20 pack year criteria. The other marginality is the ICU marginality, which is aspiration, pulmonary edema, and alveolar flooding and atelectasis. So that's the marginality that you can fix. The transplant surgeons have to figure out whether they want to accept the antecedent marginality. And in that population, a PA catheter or a CVP, some metric of volume and flow are absolutely needed, just like any other patient. And again, I don't come to work on Monday and decide, well, today's the day I'm going to box the kidneys and really dry the patient out so I can use less pressure on the ventilator. And on Tuesday, I don't come back and have this epiphany and say, well, you know, today I'm actually going to really wet the kidney out so I don't have to do dialysis and I'll just use more pressure on the ventilator. It's the same as any other management strategy that's titrated at optimal organ function from a unified perspective of the individual.
Cardiac dysfunction and vasodilatation are almost uniformly coincident processes. A lot of things potentially can contribute to vasodilatation. The greatest is the loss of vasomotor tone secondary to the brain death event itself, and brain death significantly impairs cardiac contractility. I wish I could tell you what vasopressor to use. I'm not sure there's any confirming evidence in the literature that one's preferable to the other. My sense is that carer, as with any other patient, ought to be best titrated to the element in the hydraulic model that's impaired. If the problem is volume, the answer is volume. The problem is inotropy, it's amps of inotropy. If the problem is vascular impedance, it's antagonizing the low impedance with constrictors. So it's mixing and matching the two together. If you don't have PA catheters in place, then in all likelihood, dopamine is sort of the one drug that fits most of the elements. A little bit of chronotropy, inotropy, and it constricts a little bit. It has immunomodulatory effects at the conventional dose as we normally use, and that's what we usually start with. Catecholamines have received a lot of bad press, again, dominated by older literature because of the histopath findings, probably more related to inadequate flow and inadequate volume than anything else. A reliance on fluid, or the failure to use catecholamines, by definition, requires a reliance on fluid resuscitation. And that's probably the largest culprit that jeopardizes lung function and it may further impair right ventricular function. There's other convincing arguments, and I think recent literature, particularly Schnelli's work out of the European Transplant Database, would suggest that catecholamines in conventional doses are clearly better for kidneys. The question is, are they better for hearts? So the odds ratio is much better for kidneys than for hearts. So much like sepsis, I'm not sure that the magic bullet has well worked out at this point. So as one migrates down this pathway, if one places a PA cath or uses a lidco cardiac output, and is unable to really achieve stability thresholds, in my view of it, this is where the hormonal concoction as rescue therapy is probably appropriate. This is an exceedingly contentious discussion. There is a lot of anecdotal literature, there's a lot of animal models, and many OPOs, many transplant centers have arbitrarily incorporated using hormonal cocktails up front all donors all the time. Whether that's beneficial or not is uncertain. Whether it can have adverse effects, I think, is uncertain. I think it's highly unlikely. My guess is it doesn't hurt anybody, but does it really help anybody, I think, is the big question. If one looks at the, again, the limited amount of literature, it's a scattergram for the thyroid hormone. Probably 16 studies in the cardiothoracic literature looking at inotropic um, support of hearts in post-cabbage shows it does have some inotropic support. It's probably a vasodilator as well. But the reality is, does it change outcomes? Certainly didn't in cardiothoracic. Does it really improve? organ suitability in this population. Anecdotal reports say yes. Retrospective information says yes. But you can see the perspective, some retrospective, others, it's an entire scattergram. So there really is no, no clear data to support it one way or the other. So I hold it and tend to advocate using it more in reserve. From a cardiac perspective, in the hearts that are not transplanted, logistically we'd hope to fix that. You can't fix medical. But echocardiography, about a third of the hearts that aren't used are because of abnormal echocardiograms. So again, the 21-year-old playing basketball, is there any likelihood whatsoever that he had cardiac dysfunction the day before after he poured his gunshot to the head? Highly, highly unlikely. And what one sees that for each diminution in ejection fraction of 5%, the odds ratio of not using the heart is not good. So in studies, again, which are limited, that have compared areas of histopathic logic correlation to areas of echocardiographic abnormality, there are none. They don't correlate. So it strongly supports an idea that much of the cardiac dysfunction, particularly shortly after the cardiac event, after brain death, is a reversible process, probably in at least 50% of the patients. So the ideal time to do your first echo certainly is not when the patient has a blood pressure of 60 over 40, hemoglobin of 4, potassium of 6.8, and a phosphorus of 0.4. The key is to get the patient tuned up, create the milieu where the heart will at least be as best functioning as can be, and then really whether it's tincture of time or whether it's longitudinal management, see how cardiac function unfolds. Again, handicapped as is most of this literature by its retrospective nature, this is Cal uh, CTEN looking at, again, a retrospective series of patients who had a low ejection fraction. Straightforward ICU management in this study, none actually received 
thyroid hormone, a lot of corticosteroids, which intuitively makes sense, but the literature doesn't necessarily support that either. Well, they were able to show that in this group, significant number responded identical outcomes to the group that had ideal cardiac function. So there is a recoverability in a significant number of these patients. And they were gracious enough to let me borrow one of their echoes. This comes from CTDN. And you can see whether this is aggressive ICU management and support of volume pressors or whether it's simply tincture of time and letting a damaged heart actually recrudesce his function is very uncertain. But tincture of time and watching and managing can make a big difference. I won't go into some of the subtleties about dobutamine stress viability studies. This was done in Japan where they had brain dead patients and they subjected them to dobutamine viability studies. Those that actually were able to show contractility in three days recovered their cardiac function. So there are some predictive indices available. In terms of overall management, this is the Papworth England group study. These are their acceptable criteria. These are the criteria that didn't achieve threshold. They aggressively, optimally managed invasive monitoring. They're big believers in hormonal cocktails. 44 of the 52 hearts that never would have made it to the igloo actually were procured transplanted and had outcomes indistinguishable from ideal hearts. So there's an enormous wastage at a societal level of the number of hearts that aren't used that could be placed in patients for want of aggressive management in the intensive care unit. From a pulmonary perspective, oftentimes the history is unknown. The causative event is almost uniformly associated with some abnormality in the gas-air interface in the lung itself. <laughs> Mechanical ventilation has its own potential culpable problems, and brain death physiology has recently been recognized as having a major role in pulmonary process. I think historically the blast injury with capillary permeability, neurogenic pulmonary edema, has now been complemented by an intense inflammatory response. There's some suspicion that sympathetic alteration of permeability occurs as well, but it's recently been shown that there's a very, very intense inflammatory, a preclinical injury to the lung consequent to brain death. Fisher's group has pioneered this work and in looking at IL-8, which is a chemoattractant factor for neutrophils, comparing that to lung cancer patients who had a wash and a sampling done, just profound levels of intensity of inflammation in non-traumatic, this is not polytrauma, these are isolated head injured, isolated brain bleed patients, not polytrauma. If one were to then speculate the intensity of inflammatory response in the donors related to brain death, how does it then impact upon the recipient? That was the next logical step. So they looked at the intensity of the IL-8 expression and then looked at survivorship and functionality in the recipient. IL-8 correlated with the neutrophil infiltration, correlated with the early PFI2 ratio, correlated with early graft dysfunction, correlated with longitudinal outcome and mortality. So it strongly suggests that there is an intense inflammatory response, and the lungs aren't the only unique organ. This occurs in all organs, where there's preclinical injury. And in the future, the targeted strategies won't be to use a University of Wisconsin solution to then preserve tissue that's already damaged. It will be to attenuate this response in the donor, and that's what many of our labs are beginning to look at at this point. And you can see the PFI2 ratios, early graft dysfunction, and then mortality. So it suggests, again, very strongly that there's an intense inflammatory response. Many of you are familiar with the ideal lung criteria, which many have argued are very arbitrary and capricious, drawn up almost 20 years ago. How good are these criteria in differentiating lungs that are used and not used? Well, in finer study of lungs that were not used, again, this is an unfortunate series, but none of these lungs were used, of the 47% via conventional criteria that were thought to be acceptable, 40% had significant disease. In those that were deemed unacceptable, 14% had only minor pulmonary abnormalities. So the conventional criteria really are not good at differentiating good and bad lungs. Similarly, in a, a large study that looked at histopath of donors compared to the regional donors. So no difference, they didn't sub-select a certain group. So I think you can actually take this relationship and um, exploit the relationship a bit. They found that about half of the lungs histopathologically were fine. Half the lungs were probably fine. Fisher's group did the exact same thing. 
looking at the intensity of the inflammatory response and concluded that the current criteria are poor discriminators of pulmonary injury. So again, this underscores as we look at marginal lungs, antecedent marginality is a transplant center decision, what breach you'll take with smoking. Marginality related to the ICU is in many instances fixable. And these are the acquired reversible processes that would occur that would then allow patients that historically weren't used to be transplanted. So again, I, I just would underscore as we look at this baseline status, this is the key question the transplant pulmonologist and the transplant surgeon have to answer is what's the relative balance of death on the list versus the breach of these antecedents that exist in the lung. In terms of the ICU marginality, this is a study out of Australia looking at patients that historically were below the threshold criteria. And there's some that clearly are unsuitable, the gunshots to the chest, you've got the uh, massive aspirations, but the other bunch, they subject it to aggressive intensive care unit pulmonary management, much like any other patient. Well, you can't fix everything, but half of them they fixed. And they were transplanted. Marginal constituted 57% of the aggregate donor group whose outcomes were indistinguishable from the ideal lungs. Indistinguishable from the ideal lungs. So much like the heart, it underscores that there's a lot of opportunity to then aggressively manage these patients in an intensive care unit environment. San Antonio recently published a study looking at education via the OPO staff, transplant pulmonologist, and establishing donor protocols and ensuring consent was obtained in all donors for lungs. This is their active management. Not a lot of rocket science, pressure control ventilation 25 with a PEEP of 15 for two hours. And this was done in patients with a PFO2 ratio less than 300 or alveolar infiltrates. Switching to conventional ventilatory mode with a tidal volume of 10, PEEP of 5, minimizing crystalloids, diuresis, mitigating against aspiration, and bronchoscopy to evaluate the chest x-ray area of infiltrate. So this is reasonably semi-routine management, save the uh, arbitrary pressure control. Just operationally, the key thing to remember is those that were poor that became ideal, those that were poor that became extended. These were the absolute or criteria they used. These are what constituted extended criteria. So the ideal lung had all the good absolutes and nothing from the extended criteria. The extended group had all the absolutes and they had one or more, maybe somebody with just a smoking history. And the poor didn't satisfy any of these, which are the requirements for transplantation. 75% of their donors were initially poor. 75% were initially poor. 50% actually were upgraded through that particular protocol and management to extend it or ideal. 23% were actually transplanted, and 55% of all their transplants were from donors that were initially classified as poor. So in looking at the two periods, pre-management, post-management, number of potential donors in the post, 381, the consent went from 76 to 88, the actual donors went from 38 to 98, lungs recovered, 63 to 167, lungs transplanted, 53 to 121. So again, just dramatic improvements, much like the cardiac literature, with aggressive management in the intensive care unit. Conclude with just talking briefly about fluid and recognizing again that oftentimes there's diastolic cardiovascular impairment, precipitating fluid flux, extravascular lung water, and wet lungs, which is probably the single largest cause of loss of lungs in this population. And you can see with this is probably the, this is not a randomized control, but it's a case controlled series. CVP less than six, target, target, takes a lot more fluid, change in the A gradient. And in this study, there is little discrepancy between the filling pressures on the left and right, probably due to diastolic impairment and rigidity of the heart. But a lot of it ends up in the lung. So it's judicious fluid resuscitation and volume. Lastly, if one looks at kidney, the biggest thing you can do is maintain good cardiovascular hemodynamics. Decay in the creatinine and a urine output more than 100 cc's per hour. These are the things that are associated that are amenable to change. A lot of things you can't fix but these are two things that you can fix.
And with livers, similarly, there are a lot of things that you can't really fix, but this is one that can be fixed. Ideally, the sodium should be less than 155, and I think we're moving in a direction with the recognition that glycogen depletion is one of the things that is involved in increasing the magnitude of the intensity of ischemia reperfusion injury, beginning to feed gut, don gut feed donors during that process is a process on, in the evolution. So I'd conclude with that. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Hope I've left you with a sense that donor management really is an integral part of intensive care unit management, and it is truly the medical management of six to eight other lives simultaneously that warrants the same level of intensity and the same level of integrative multidisciplinary care that we would apply to any other patient. I'd be happy to take any questions.